Good morning. Glad to see you guys today. I'm always impressed when people take seriously enough their spiritual growth and development to actually take time out in the week and gather together with other believers for the purpose of, of trying to grow and learn. So my hat's off to you. And for those that are watching online, thank you so much for being part of our service. It might be morning, afternoon, or evening where you are, but we're glad that you are participating with us today. Probably one of the most common denominators that a human being has with another human being is, is not the color of our skin, our education, our income capacity, our IQ. It's not our relationship status, it's not our geography. Probably one of the most common denominators is our doubt. We just struggle with wondering and worrying about how things are going to turn out. And for lots of people, when it comes to doubt, they assume that if you have any, you're not qualified to be a follower of Jesus. Or they worry that once, or they hope that once you become a follower of Jesus in some way, that will eliminate all doubt. So let's just do a poll this morning. How many would say that uh, doubt and worries still come to your mind from time to time? Okay. And that's most of us, right? So we're going to look at four stories today where the common denominator is doubt and unbelief. And so we're not surprised that that exists. What is surprising is Jesus' response in these four different stories. The first one begins in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 53, where it says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. And coming to his hometown, he began preaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? By the way, these are common names, so when you know, if you know the names of some of Jesus' disciples, you might be wondering if they were his brothers, and it's actually not those guys. Aren't all, these, aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. The town is Nazareth, and it's the place where Jesus grew up. And so uh, after uh, he was born in Bethlehem, but you're probably aware they became refugees for a short time because of a political attempt to kill all babies who were born in Bethlehem within a two-year period. And so they went uh, out of the country, but they came back in. And when they came back in, they went to Nazareth uh, to be raised. And it was there that Jesus began to do teach some of his uh, parables and, and his teachings, but also he began to perform some miracles. And the people who see this start out amazed. That's what it says. And they were all amazed. And then they start asking a series of questions. And there's actually seven questions that are recorded for us that they ask. Where did this person get this wisdom? Where did this person get these miraculous powers? Isn't he the son of the carpenter? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers, and they list their names, aren't his sisters still around here? So where did this guy get what he has? And it ends up with, it starts with, they were amazed. And after seven questions, they took offense. It's really interesting. And the only thing they're focused on between amazed and defense is the family of Jesus. So uh, sometimes we struggle to believe in Jesus because of the family of Jesus. That's not just true back then. That's true now. I mean, there are lots of people, they love the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, the, the attitude of Jesus. But when they look at the people who claim to follow Jesus, they really struggle with them. I mean, there are some people that they just, their attitudes, their, their maybe demeaning character, their faults and their failures, and, and yet they claim to be part of the family of God. And, and we just struggle to accept that. Like, if God lets people like that in, and then we wonder if we want to be a part of it. And so we get 
perplexed, we get frustrated. And what it tells us is really interesting. It says, and Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Now, this passage is not telling us that unbelief is like kryptonite to Jesus, that if you get unbelief around him, his powers fade and he gets weak and he doesn't know what to do. That's not what's going on. When people struggle with unbelief, they simply don't bring their issues, their concerns, and their problems to Jesus to begin with. You don't take medicine that you don't think is going to work, and you don't go to, go to a doctor that you don't think is going to help you. And so they were just keeping their distance. And what's really interesting is that what we discover is Jesus then moves out of Nazareth. This is actually the last time in the life of Jesus that we will see him in his own hometown. He moves on from there, and he's not angry, and he's not hurt. He just respects the decisions that people are making about him. If they won't access him for the help that he can provide, he will go to places where people do want and need help. And so he moves on from there. Jesus doesn't try to force people into believing in him or following him. Now, some of Jesus' family <laughs> does do that, but Jesus doesn't do that. Then we go into another story, really strange. It says, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. Verses 3 through 12 gives us a little bit of a backstory. Herod is actually the son of Herod the Great, which is the guy who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. This Herod is actually going to see Jesus at the time of his crucifixion. At first, they bring Jesus to Pilate. Pilate doesn't want to deal with this because there's so much tumult in the culture about Jesus. He sends him to Herod. Herod sends him back to him. So this is Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch. Tetrarch is kind of a title, uh, and uh, he had less of a title than his father did. The kingdom was broken up in, into multiple areas and, and, and kind of meted out. And, and he's a really interesting character, but he's struggling to understand who Jesus is. He thinks that it could be John the Baptist resurrected, and there's a reason that he thinks that. So here's the backstory. Herod was married to a royal princess. Uh, her father was a king in his own kingdom, and, and they had had this marriage. But Herod went on a trip to Rome, and on his way, stayed at his brother's house. And when he got to his brother's house, uh, he fell in love with his brother's wife. And so his brother's wife decided she would divorce her husband, and Herod decided he would divorce his wife, and then they decided they would form a new marriage. And John the Baptist had the audacity to say, that's not proper. Now, if you want a little more history, it's kind of interesting. When the princess who was forced into divorce went back to her father, he marshaled an army and attacked in a military way against Herod. And Herod actually lost that, uh, uh, that battle. And he appealed to Rome. He wanted the emperor to help him. And so that emperor was actually going to send more troops, but he suddenly died. And then the whole plan, the next guy said, yeah, we're not doing that. And so they just went on. But here's, here's Herod. And by the way, uh, curiously enough, Herod's father's name was Herod. Herod's name is Herod. And this new woman that he fell in love with is named Herodias. Maybe he just likes the name. I don't know. <laughs> Could be something there. And so, so we get this backstory. And, and John the Baptist says, it's not proper to do this. And so... Uh, rich and powerful men are not used to being told things they don't like to hear, and so he had John arrested and put in prison. He couldn't shut him up, but he could put him in a place where nobody else would hear him. Now it's Herod's birthday, and Herod is uh, an epitome of a rich and powerful person. When he does a birthday, he does it in every kind of excessive way that you can possibly imagine. Lots of alcohol, lots of people, and his new wife's daughter does a dance, and it's so exotic and provocative. He's so pleased by it that he tells the daughter, I will give you anything you want, just say it. And so Herodias, his new wife, goes over and whispers to her daughter, tell him you want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. How would you feel about being married to a person who when you asked what they wanted, they said someone else's head on a platter? 
This is rough. And so, and, and Herod's caught because he said this out loud. He made this extravagant and excessive promise. And now a lot of people heard it. What's he going to do? And he didn't want to do it. And he felt sad about it, but he followed through on it. And they beheaded John the Baptist and brought that head out on a platter for everyone at the party to see. What's going on here? What you are seeing is a man who lives with a lot of excess in his life also can't control his words. And he winds up making promises and statements he wish he could walk back, but because he fears what people will think about him, he winds up doing things he regrets and wish he didn't have to do. Sometimes we struggle to believe in Jesus because of our own family. Herod's family was a mess, and he was a mess. He was a person given to excess and didn't know how to bring control into his life. And there's so many people today that when they look at their own family and they think about following God, they think that somehow they're disqualified because their family struggles with very severe things, or maybe they struggle with things that pull them in directions they wish they did not have to go. And they wind up doing things to please people because it's the only way to get ahead in their life or at least keep your head above water. And so they're constantly constantly struggling and they really doubt that Jesus would ever have anything to do with them because they're a hot mess and they come from a family of a hot mess. And so they struggle with that. And the good news is for people who are willing to reach out to Jesus, even with all of those fears and doubts, they discover that Jesus is a rescuer, that, that he's a restorer, he's a healer. Uh, let's continue on. Um, when Jesus, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them and healed the, their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. They're, they're out in the wilderness. There's no nearby towns. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass and then taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were 5,000 men besides the women and children. In this story, by the way, this is the only miracle of Jesus that is recorded in all four Gospels. And, and he performs this miracle, and, and uh, Matthew makes the point that they're out in a remote place. It's, it's a wilderness. He wants us to, rem to remind us of the Old Testament when Moses brought the nation of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt and was moving them towards the promised land. And they were in the wilderness, and they had nothing to eat, and God supernaturally fed them. So he, he very much wants us to, to think about that. And people had followed Jesus. This is really interesting. Jesus had gotten into a boat, and that's how he was getting where he was going. But all the people who knew about Jesus, they were watching on the shore and just running to keep up with the boat. And when Jesus' boat came into shore, they were there waiting for him. And there was a lot of them, 5,000 men plus women and children. And what's fascinating is, is when Jesus gets out of the boat, he's not annoyed. He's not frustrated that they followed him. He was trying to get away, trying to get a break. And, and, and now when he gets off the boat, everybody's there, probably even more than the people that he left. And, and he's not annoyed because what he sees is an opportunity for ministry. And for Jesus, ministry is not just the public teaching where lots of people hear him at one time. It's also personal ministry. And so he, this is a long day that the disciples are putting in and that Jesus is putting in. And the disciples are really tired. How many have ever been really tired? How many are tired right now? 
How many are too tired to raise your hand? Yeah. So the disciples, they were ready for this day to end. And they come to Jesus kind of in an ungracious way. They, they, they don't ask a question. They give an order. And they said, send these people away. We're in a remote place. Tell them to go to a nearby village and get something to eat. And, uh, and once again, kind of reminding us of this man in the wilderness. And Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat. So they assess their provisions. It's five loaves and two fish, 5,000 men plus women and children. And they come to a conclusion. It's not enough. It's not enough. Sometimes we struggle to believe that we have enough or that we are enough. So what does Jesus tell them to do? Bring them to me. In a prequel of what would be the Lord's Supper, we see Jesus taking the bread and breaking it, looking up towards heaven, giving thanks, blessing it, returning it to his disciples to distribute to the people who were seated on the grass. And so it's kind of a prequel of the Lord's Supper, but I'm fascinated by some of the things here that take place. And that is, first of all, what looks like woefully inadequate in our hands can look very different when they're put in Jesus' hands. Very different. For example, we just took up an offering to help people who are struggling with the after effects of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And our contribution was uh, just a little under 4,000. What difference can that make? But in our hands, it doesn't make any difference at all. But when we put it into the hands of Jesus and put it in the hands of people who can make a difference and other believers do the same, it's amazing the amount of help that can be done with that. And by the way, if you want to contribute towards that again or for the first time, that, that line item is still open in our giving options. What looks like not enough in our hands looks different in his hands. And then Jesus does something. I think there's so much wisdom here. I, I could preach a whole message on this. Don't worry, I'm not. But I'm, I could preach a whole message on this. Jesus gives thanks for what we don't think is enough. It is very hard to be thankful when you think you don't have enough money or you don't have enough talent or you don't have enough time or you don't have enough friends or you don't have enough education, you don't have enough capacity and we look at our inadequacies and the gratitude that could be there never comes because it's not enough. But when we put that in Jesus' hands, one of the things he is is grateful for the thing that we think is not enough. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just next time you think I'm not enough, just thank God for what it is that you have and watch what happens as a result of that. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I, I mean, that's one of my takeaways today. When I'm feeling inadequate and not enough, which happens a lot more than you might think, just to take that and place whatever it is in Jesus' hands and be thankful for what he can do in it and through it. Jesus gives thanks. And and. What else is interesting? This is actually not a healing miracle. It's a helping miracle. Jesus has healed a lot of people, but this, he's just helping provide nutrition. Question, what do you need to bring to Jesus today and place in his hands? Not just what do you need healed, where do you need help? That, that could be a really interesting exercise. All right, you ready? Last story. You're not ready? I can wait. <laughs> Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of them to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out. They're screaming in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. For those of you who have kind of been raised in church, uh, the original language on this is, is fascinating. Take courage. I am. And I am is a very ancient way that Jesus, or God referred to himself in the Old Testament and Jesus uses on occasion in the New Testament. Then, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, 
Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus did send his disciples on ahead. He's staying to say goodbye to the people as they're being dismissed and going, heading home. And then Jesus goes up on a mountainside to pray. This is really intriguing to me. I think most of us would assume that it's wise to pray before you do a ministry event. You need God's wisdom, God's guidance, God's strength, God's discernment, so all, all the gifts that God would do to make it possible. But Jesus doesn't see prayer just as a way to prepare for ministry that you're about to do, but also to recover from ministry that you have done. <laughs> That's a really useful skill to develop, I think, in our lives, because if we've kind of exerted ourselves in, in helping the family of God or our community in some way, a lot of times we just want to veg out. We just you know, put on uh, something on, on television or online and, and just kind of watch, uh, uh, queue up our video game, let's go. And, and that's how we recalibrate. And Jesus actually understood that sometimes the best way to, to recover from uh, a season of putting out a lot is actually to include prayer. And uh, meanwhile, the disciples had gone out in their boat and they'd gotten a ways from the shore, but they're facing a lot of winds now. The, uh, uh, a lot of wind has, has come up and their backs are into the oars, but they're not making any progress at all. And the waves are, are very high. And just before the sun comes up, Jesus comes walking to them, uh, towards them on the lake. Now, I know that for lots of people thinking that uh, Jesus can do miraculous things, that these are other something, um, anything other than just a metaphorical uh, story, it's very difficult for our minds to comprehend or imagine. And what I can tell you is, uh, even if you saw it, uh, I wish I could say everyone who saw a miracle automatically became a believer, but that's actually not how it works. We, we second guess ourselves. We wonder if we were deceived by what we were seeing. We, we wonder if things would have happened anyway. There's a lot of rationality that we work through, even when we see spectacular things. And what's interesting here is the disciples are terrified. Like they're, they're screaming in horror. They thought they were seeing a ghost and, and they probably assumed if there's a ghost coming to us, then we're all about to be ghosts. This is not a good sign. And, and Jesus identifies himself and tells them that there's nothing to fear, which brings us to our fourth point of fourth way we can doubt. And sometimes we struggle to believe what Jesus says. We struggle to believe because of the family of Jesus. We struggle to believe because of our own family. Uh, we struggle to believe because we feel like we don't have enough. And sometimes we just struggle to believe what Jesus says. Peter said, if it's really you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And Peter steps down from the boat. And for a fleeting moment, it feels solid underneath him. And uh, what's really interesting is in this moment, um, he begins to be distracted. The winds are very high. Everything didn't become calm just because Jesus was close. And, and he's looking around and the waves are still whipping up a, a huge fury. And he gets distracted and he becomes afraid. And I think maybe this is where the, the phrase... Uh, you, you had a sinking feeling comes from. Like he, he just starts dropping down into the water. And I don't think this is a, a slow, oh look, two inches, oh look, four inches. <laughs> like I think he's dropping pretty quick and, and he screams out to, to Jesus. There's a commercial, I don't know if you've seen it on, on television, about a, a, a dad who screamed when there was a spider. Has anybody seen that? And, and he denies that he screamed, but they do a replay. And, and the son kind of gloats and says, I'm sorry you had to relive that again. You know? And uh, so he's screaming. He's crying out. And Jesus grabs him immediately. There's some takeaways from this. Uh, 
It seems as though that Jesus does not exempt us from trouble in our world, but he does come to us in the trouble that we're in. That's a good thing to remember when we're doubting that because we're facing some really hard things and we're not making any progress and we're exhausted from trying so hard and, and it seems like nothing is working for us, it's really easy to assume maybe Jesus is far from me. He comes to us in our troubles. Is there anybody in the room happy about that? He comes to us in our trouble. Our troubles do not keep him away from us. Yeah. And what, what else is really interesting here is, is Peter says, if it's really you, give me a command. He doesn't say, if it's really you, give me a promise. Promise my boat won't sink. Promise I won't get wet. Promise this will not be hard. Promise it'll be okay. I wonder how many of us, what might be different in our spiritual life if we listen for the commands of Jesus rather than just the promises that we long to hear that our life will be easier and better. And I think we struggle with the commands of Jesus and the commands of God because we make an assumption that those commands are actually limiting in some way. We can think of all the rules, but this command of Jesus is actually enabling. You listen to what Jesus says, and for a brief moment in time, Peter actually discovered that there was something solid under him, and it probably wasn't the water as much as it was the words of Jesus themselves. He's walking in obedience to the command of Jesus. Jesus said he has come to enable us to live a full life. He did not say he came to give us a trouble-free life. And when we're experiencing those troubles, we just doubt. And then Peter replied, tell me to come to you. When Jesus rescues him, brings him back to the boat, everybody worships. They say, truly, you are the son of God. Sometimes we want God to prove who he is by everything going well for us. But in this moment, it was actually in the storm that brought them to the point and the realization, Jesus is far more than we thought. He is the Son of God. So I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. And I have uh, these questions for you. And, and sometimes it's, it helps us think if we're not looking around. So would you just bow your heads and, and uh, if you're comfortable, close your eyes. Um, is this a season in your life when you need to cry out to Jesus? I mean, maybe you're hearing things are going pretty good right now, and that's great. But maybe you're here, and there's a lot that's unknown. And you have less confidence in yourself than, than you've known before. And you're not sure you're going to make it. Uh, maybe your doubt has risen because of things you've seen in others who are part of the family of Jesus. Maybe your doubt has risen because you've seen the mess that's your own family or the, the things of excess that you struggle with in your life and their control of you. Maybe doubt is raising because You've been confronted with your own limitations one more time. And it's, it feels like it's too much. Or maybe your doubt is rising because not just the difficulties that you face, but your own failures. And so this is what I would encourage you today. Stop looking at people. Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at what you feel you don't have. Stop looking at what you're struggling with. Look to Jesus. Call out to Jesus and watch how he will draw near you, extend a hand towards you, and you're about to learn something about him that will reveal to you how great he really is. Father, Help all of us today call out to you and depend on you. In Jesus' name, amen.